Previously, we viewed diffusion in one dimension. However diffusion occurs in three dimensions. And does not move smoothly, but randomly according to Brownian motion. In fluid, such as CSF, this results in equal diffusivity in every direction. In gray matter, comprised of cells and other structures that block water movement, diffusivity is limited in all directions. In white matter, comprised of axons, water can diffuse easily parallel with an axon bundle, but diffusivity is restricted perpendicular to the bundle. With diffusion imaging, we leverage these diffusivity differences to determine the type of tissue generating our NMR signal, as well as the direction of axon bundles. To do this, we first need to realize that signal is lost only from diffusion across the gradient direction. If our gradient is left to right, along the x-axis, and the spins only diffuse up and down along the y-axis, they experience the exact same amount of dephasing and rephasing, spin realignment is perfect, and no signal is lost. If we change our gradient direction in order to cause spins at the top to press us faster than spins at the bottom, the same diffusion will lead to signal loss. Here, because the spins diffuse along the same direction as the gradient, realignment is not perfect and some signal is not recovered by the rephasing gradient. By measuring more signal loss from the y direction gradient than the x direction, we can infer there is more diffusion along the y axis and it is more likely axons are present and oriented in that direction. The diffusivity inferred from signal loss is termed the diffusion coefficient, and can be quantified through the Stechskel-Tanner equation. In this equation, K symbolizes the direction of the gradient field. S sub K is the amount of signal measured after the dephasing and rephasing gradient in direction K. S sub zero is the full amount of signal measured with no diffusion gradient. And the variable B is the B value covered in the previous segment. By reordering this equation, we more easily see how the, the diffusion coefficient is quantified by signal loss. As the amount of signal after the diffusion gradient decreases, the amount of inferred diffusion along that direction increases. By performing many scans and determining the diffusion coefficient at several gradient directions, we begin to populate what is termed Q-space. In Q-space, the position of a diffusivity value is based on gradient direction. Once we have measured several diffusivity values in Q-space, we can attempt to deduce the structure present in the voxel. Here, diffusion values appear larger along one direction suggesting this voxel contains an axon bundle, and it's oriented along the larger diffusivity values. To quantify the structure suggested from these values, we mathematically construct a tensor from six diffusivity measurements. The six measurements afford six degrees of freedom in the tensor, which take the form of XYZ orientation, and XYZ length. This elongated tensor illustrates anisotropic, or unequal diffusion, which we interpret as axon presence along the tensor orientation. If, the diffusion values are equal throughout Q-space, or isotropic, the tensor will be spherical, and indicates the voxel is comprised of free-moving fluid like CSF. Smaller isotropic measurements will form a smaller but still spherical tensor, indicating the voxel is comprised of cells or other structures which restrict diffusion equally in all directions. By combining diffusion imaging with spatial encoding techniques, we can take diffusion measurements from many voxels. Converting these measurements into tensors at each voxel enables us to see how tensor shapes correlate across space. Tractography, a technique we will later detail, is then used on this type of data to identify axon tracks throughout the brain. This concludes the diffusivity, Q-space, and DTI segment.